All right then. So we are moving into chapter 11 today. Chapter 11, um, you'll notice this is the first time we've really gone out of sequence as far as the book is concerned. And the reason why is it makes sense for us to actually look at solutions reactions and solution properties consecutively rather than splitting them apart and talking about gases in the middle. We just did a whole unit on all these kinds of chemical reactions that occur in aqueous solution. Well, now we're going to get into what kinds of physical properties do these solutions have? And how can we quantify some of those properties? So in chapter eight, we talked about some ways of looking at concentration. In particular, we looked at molarity and we looked at those mass ratio ones, the percent by mass, the parts per million, the parts per billion. And what we noted in each of those cases is that there were some times where one of those units was appropriate and there were times when those units were inappropriate. If I have a nine molar solution, I probably am not gonna wanna express it in parts per billion. The number's gonna be absolutely astronomical. But if I have a solution that's 0 0.00001 molar, the chances are parts per million, parts per billion are really good units for that. So that was one example of limitation that we could talk about. One point to an issue of molarity. In molarity, we have moles of solute for every liter of solution. This is a really common unit of concentration and it works really well, especially when we do things like titrations or solution stoichiometry, where I've got a solution, I'm trying to figure out how much uh, mass of whatever it reacts with. There is an issue with it, however, and that issue lies in the unit here in the denominator, liters of solution. Liters of solution are great if we are going to stay at one temperature. But as you know, temperature does have an impact on volume. We've talked before about the idea of thermal expansion or contraction. Now, normally those thermal expansions and contractions are very minute. But in a situation where we have a relatively small concentration, that thermal expansion could be big, have a major impact on the concentration which means that our molarity would also have a temperature dependence. Different molar concentration at 100 degrees Celsius versus zero degrees Celsius. Well, that could be kind of a problem, right? Do I really want to, if I'm doing a titration, have to be super aware of what temperature I conduct the titration at? So, to combat some of these things, we've developed another unit of concentration. And it's set up very similarly to molarity. We call it molality. Now notice, the difference between molarity and molality, other than turning the capital M of molarity into a lowercase m for molality, the numerator is exactly the same. We've got moles of solute. The difference is in that denominator. In the denominator here, we have kilograms of solvent. Kilograms of solvent is a mass unit. Masses do not change with temperature. So what we have here in molality is a concentration unit that is completely temperature independent. So, when we do certain kinds of studies that involve temperature changes, molality becomes a lot more important. 
You saw an example of this in the lab that you did last week at home. The freezing point depression lab that you looked at, you had to figure out molalities of solutions. Why molality? Well, because you're changing the temperature of that lauric acid solution. You're heating it up to get it to melt. You're cooling it down to see when it froze. Molality is the appropriate unit there because its concentration isn't going to change at all as you go through those temperature variations. So where do we see this kind of unit taking place? And we see it when temperature changes are possible. where we need to have a concentration that is consistent over a wide variety of temperatures, we're gonna find molality in those kinds of calculations. Now, there is a method for converting between molarity of a solution and molality of solution. You think about the calculations that we did on Monday during the review, where we went for per, from percent to molarity and vice versa. In that case, we needed a density to help us to bridge the gap between grams of solution and liters of solution. Well, this is really no different. The only difference is that we're going to be using density to help us figure out our volume and mass of solution to help us figure out our volume of solvent. So I will tell you, this calculation is a little bit more complex than what we did on Monday. You can't solve it usually with direct dimensional analysis like we did with the other ones on Monday. But we can use dimensional analysis as a key component to the process. So if you were one of those people that likes to break apart the equation, solve the numerator, solve the denominator, divide them by each other, find the new molarity, find the new percent, pretty much that's the method we're going to use for this. Because overall, what we will see is that since both have moles of solute at their core, the real trick to going between them isn't going between the kilograms of solvent and the liters of solution. And that's where our molar mass and our density are gonna be the most important factors to us. So your book gives you a flow chart. I'm not sure how helpful this flow chart really is as far as organizing things is concerned. Best way to go about doing this is to do some examples. So number one, determine the molality of a 0.194 nitric acid solution if the density of the solution is 1.10 grams per milliliter. Well, from this standpoint, again, it's important for us to recognize where we are and what we're trying to find. 0.194 molar means I have 0.194 moles of nitric acid for every one liter of solution. Now I need to turn this into moles of nitric acid for every kilogram of water. So 
The nice thing here, top half's already done. The number of moles of nitric acid is not going to change. What I have to figure out is what is in that denominator. And to do that, I'm gonna to have to break this solution into pieces. Solute plus solvent equals solution. Based on the density, I can figure out this one part here. One liter of solution is equal to 1,000 milliliters of solution. And every milliliter weighs 1.10 grams. So I would have 1,100 grams of solution. Now I'm trying to figure out grams of solvent. So how am I gonna figure out the missing piece, the solute? What information do I have about the solute, the nitric acid that I can turn into mass to take this to the next step? We have the number of moles, 0.194 moles of HNO3, we can turn that into a mass, one mole of nitric acid hydrogen is 1.01, nitrogen is 14.01, oxygen is 16 and there are three of them, so 16 times three, 63.02 grams of nitric acid for every mole. So 63.02 times 0 0.194, 12.2 grams of HNO3. If I subtract these two numbers from each other, I would get the number of grams of water. So 1100 minus 12.2 um, to the correct number of sig figs, 1090 grams of water, which would be 1.09 kilograms. So like I said, we can kind of break it into pieces and figure out what's missing. Based on the one liter of solution, I could figure out how much the solution weighed based on the 0.194 moles of nitric acid, I can figure out how much was solute. The remainder had to have been the solvent water. I converted that into kilograms. Now I divide. Point one nine four divide by one point zero nine to three significant figures zero point one seven eight molal, so lowercase m nitric acid.
All right, so again, the process here is really about flipping that denominator. I got to turn that volume into a mass. It's not quite as simple as what we did the other day. I can't just use density. I have to do density and a subtraction to figure out the solvent, just the solvent. All right, any questions here? All right, let's move on to another kind of concentration unit. This concentration unit is called mole fraction. Mole fraction is abbreviated by um, what looks like the letter X. It's actually not. Um, this is actually the uppercase Greek letter chi. Um, you'll see it sometimes kind of as a funny looking X like that. Um, the font package that came with this it doesn't quite show it that way. Nonetheless, the mole fraction of a substance is equal to the moles of that substance divided by the total number of moles for all of the components of that solution. Now, what's interesting about mole fraction is that you can technically calculate mole fraction for any component of the solution just like you could, can, could calculate percent mass by any part of the solution. Now, another thing to notice here, there's no multiplying. Mole fraction is a fraction. It's gonna be a decimal number, less than one. We aren't gonna multiply it by 100%. We're not gonna multiply it by a million or a billion. It is a ratio. It's a mole ratio in this case. Now, the reason we focus on that aspect of it is because there are some applications where we want the mole fraction of the solvent. And actually one of the first colligative properties that we will explore looks at just that. What is the impact on the solvent? And so to know the impact on the solvent, I need to know how much of the solution is solvent. The more solvent that's present in the solution, the less of an impact that the solute has on. So be very careful with these kinds of quantities. Make sure that you are calculating the right thing. Make sure that you're following the direction then. All right, here's a second example. In this example, we give you some information about a solution of acetic acid. And we want you to find four different things out about that solution. So I'm actually gonna move this to the whiteboard because we're going to need more space than what's here. Seventy-five grams of acetic acid. Are dissolved in 245 grams of water. to make 309 milliliters of solution. Okay, so 
Lots of stuff to find here. Again, we moved it over here because we definitely want the extra space. Now I can guarantee you that there's probably going to be a problem like this somewhere stashed in that exam in two weeks. I love to give this kind of a problem because it really does kind of go after a lot of different concepts at once and making sure that you can get your definition straight. So fair warning, you're gonna see something like this. Maybe not the same thing, but similar. Now, when I get a problem like this, I know that there's gonna be a lot of common ground. So before I actually go about solving each one of these individually, I'm gonna go through and do a couple of preliminary calculations just to kind of get on the right track. So in particular, I'm gonna calculate the number of moles of acetic acid and the number of moles of water because I know that for the mole fraction, I'm gonna end up needing both. Why go through all this early? Save me a little bit of time at the end. I've already got all the kind of the grunt work of the calculations done. I just start popping values into the equations from there. Acetic acid, 1.01 .01 for hydrogen, two times 12.01 .01 for carbon, three times 1.01 .01 .01 for the hydrogen and two times 16 for the oxygen, 60.06 .06 grams in one mole, 75 divided by 60.06, 1.25 moles of acetic acid. Molar mass of water, most of you know it by heart by now, 18.02 grams, 245 divided by 18.02, to four significant figures, 13.60 moles of water. If I add those two together, I get 14.85 moles in total. One more thing that we'll wanna do, 75.0 grams for the solute plus 245.0 grams for the solvent. Gives me 320.0 grams of total solution. All right, so I've got all of the pieces and parts. And in fact, I've got more pieces and parts to calculate other kinds of calculations if I wanted to. If I wanted the mass percent, I could do that because I now have mass of solution and mass of solvent and mass of solute. I could do it that way. Let's start with the first one, molarity. Molarity, capital M, is equal to moles of acetic acid per liter of solution. We've already established 1.25 moles. For liters, I need to take that 309 milliliters and turn it into liters. So it'd be 0 0.309 liters. 1.25 divided by 0.309 
to three significant figures, it's 4.05 molar, capital M, H, N, O, 3. Oops, sorry. Got ahead of myself. Acetic acid. C2, H3, O2. All right, so my molarity is 4.05. If I had a density, I could turn that molarity into molality. Or, because I've already been given the information, molality, little m, is equal to moles of acetic acid divided by kilograms of water, the solvent, it's the same 1.25 moles, but now it's 0.245 kilograms. 1.25 divided by 0 0.2450, three significant figures, 5.10 molal, little m, acetic acid. For mole fraction of water, we want the mole fraction. So chi. Now to differentiate, um, to figure out what it is, we will often use the substance as the subscript. So the mole fraction of water would be chi H2O as the subscript. It's moles of water over total moles. 13. 0 0.60 moles of water over 14.85 moles in total. Four significant figures this time, 13.60 divided by 14.85, 0 0.9158. And then finally, density. Density is mass of solution over milliliters of solution. So this is where that total mass that we calculated before comes in. 320.0 grams divided by the 309 milliliters. To three significant figures, 1.04 grams per milliliter. So we've hit all four bullet points. Took us a little bit of time to do it, but we got all four of them. Now, obviously, this is something that you can do a lot faster on your own if you don't have to explain every single step that you did along the way. Comes with practice. But these are the kinds of things that you can do. You now have in your toolbox a number of different ways of expressing concentration. And with those different ways of expressing concentration, they are going to come in handy in different situations. The key attribute is really going to be when is the appropriate time 
to do those things. When is it the appropriate time to pull out molality? When is it the appropriate time to pull out mole fraction? When is density relevant to us? And that comes with practice. That comes with experience. And you're going to get plenty of it between now and that, in the end of next week. So any questions with this example before we move on to something else? All right, so let's move on to why we're really here. Solution concentration, that was a nice aside, but it's not the whole thing. Why do we care so much about concentration and concentration units? Well, it has to do with the fact that we use those concentrations to help us to quantify certain types of colligative properties. Now, colligative properties are certain kinds of properties that exist that are solely dependent upon the nature of how much of a substance is present, but not necessarily on what the substance is. So we're looking at some particular physical properties. Again, the, the key word here is physical. Physical properties that will be impacted by the concentration of the solute particles in the solution, but not necessarily on what the, the particles themselves are. Now, these tie back to another concept that we've discussed in the past, that concept being in particular intermolecular forces going back to chapter six. What we find is that the stronger the intermolecular forces are between these objects and each other, the more that the colligative properties that we're talking about end up being impacted. Now we're gonna study four properties overall. One of them relates to vapor pressure. We call it Raoult's law. In particular, it talks about the impact of a solute on lowering the vapor pressure of a solvent. So you may have thought to yourself, wondered um, about certain kinds of things like, well, why does, um, you know, why does uh, antifreeze, why do we put antifreeze in a radiator um, in the car? Well, it's not just uh, to prevent it from locking up in cold conditions, but the impact there also prevents the, um, the, the water in the radiator from, from boiling over, from going, going too high as well. Um, we're gonna also look at boiling point elevation. Um, similarly, related to that Raoult's law, but in a different kind of way. We're gonna look at freezing point. Why do we sulk the driveway in the middle of winter? Well, there's a particular reason for it. Probably never discussed the science of it with your parents when they just kicked you outside in the snow and said, go do it. But there's a reason for it. And then osmotic pressure, which, uh, has a lot of really cool applications um, commercially um, that you probably have never really thought about. You just kind of accept it. So let's talk about vapor pressure. Now, this is not our first exposure to vapor pressure. In chapter six, we talked about vapor pressure from the intermolecular forces standpoint and looking at, well, substances that have strong intermolecular forces have low vapor pressures and substances that have weak intermolecular forces tend to have high vapor pressures. Well, now we're throwing something new in there. We're throwing in this idea of, well, what if we don't have a pure substance? So just to kind of review, vapor pressure itself comes from the evaporation of a liquid and the pressure that is exerted by those particles that have evaporated. If I have a closed container like this one, 
the vapor particles are going to be trapped inside of this vessel. And we're going to eventually hit an equilibrium where evaporation and condensation kind of start to equal each other out. And the net result is that we are going to get a pressure inside of the container that is measurable. Now we take that lid off, the vapor particles are able to escape. We never actually establish that equilibrium. And for that reason, we end up seeing evaporation take place where the evaporation far exceeds the condensation rate and the liquid level inside of that cup or that beaker goes down gradually over time. But if we got it sealed, we're gonna see that and we're gonna be able to measure that more consistently. Just as a reminder, the boiling point of a solution or a solvent is when that pressure on the outside matches the pressure coming up from the vapor. So when atmospheric pressure pushing down and vapor pressure pushing up are equal, we no longer say that the substance is evaporating. We now say that it is boiling. That is the difference between the two. Now, there are a couple of things that impact vapor pressure overall. We talked about in chapter six, the ideas of temperature, surface area, intermolecular forces, those kinds of things that are inherent to the substance itself and the internal energy of those particles. When we have stronger forces, they, the molecules tend to stick together more. You need to put in more energy to break them apart. And we talked about that in terms of a lower, boil, a lower vapor pressure, a higher boiling point as a result. The other factor, this factor that we haven't considered yet because we really hadn't talked about solutions yet. What if we introduce a solute that happens to not be volatile, meaning it's not going to evaporate as well? Well, in that case, we know that as part of the solution making process, the intermolecular forces that existed between the solvent particles and themselves have been replaced in some part by stronger intermolecular forces that now exist between the solvent particles and the solute particles. Well, if by forming a solution, we've now created more strong forces, what do you think that means for the vapor pressure? The forces are now stronger. It's gonna take more kinetic energy to break them apart. We're gonna see a lowering of vapor pressure as a result. And so we're gonna stop at that spot for today. Just as I peek ahead, you're gonna see that where we're gonna go eventually is we're gonna be able to quantify just how big that impact is using Raoult's law here. So we'll pick up with that on Friday but for right now, just kind of marinate on that idea. The stronger intermolecular forces of the solution are going to have a massive impact on the vapor pressure itself. And so where we're going next is how to quantify all of that and start putting some numbers to it. Have a good afternoon.